Okay, hello. Thanks for, for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm going to run through these slides I hope fairly quickly in order to leave uh, roughly a half an hour for the questions and answers and comments. Um, I understand then that a competitive advantage here because uh, this doesn't work in both directions from a voice point of view. But I, I, I have answered here to be fair about each answers each question here. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I want to explain the title. Uh, I want to talk both about the importance of fussing generally at the end of the particular role and potentially with DRT uh, to either help or hurt uh, the improvement uh, in public transportation and the use of public transportation to build the city. So, um, no. So, uh, first of all, I want to frame the discussion as being not about buses per se or public transportation per se, but as being about cities and the kind of cities uh, that will be cities that people love to live in, cities that provide opportunity. Uh, cities that are efficient. Uh, I'm taking it as a given that cities are growing all over the world and will continue to grow. And the question is, can they grow in a manner that uh, makes people happy uh, and, and prosperous and having opportunity? Uh, I think that public transportation is a key factor in the ability to develop that kind of city. Uh, public transportation offers the opportunity to be more efficient, uh, much more efficient uh, than automobile-oriented uh, mobility. If we consider not just the cost of the infrastructure, but the cost of the automobiles and the fuel and the consumed in an auto-oriented society, public transportation is a very good direction uh, for our cities to go. So to me, the question is, given a view of cities as being very important and public transportation as being an important city builder, what role do buses play in that particular what role does DRT play? And there are two components to this question. One is the transportation that we tend to focus on within the transportation field, but the other is the land use, uh, which we believe uh, is not just uh, a factor that generates the need for transportation, uh, but is also a form which adjusts to transportation. So land use is both a driver of the transportation demand, but the land use pattern is also a result of the kind of transportation that we uh, provide. So the questions are, uh, what role do buses play generally? What role does BRT play? Uh, and of course, what role does rail play? So the, uh, I like to go back to the origin of the word bus. Uh, it comes from the word omnibus, uh, which is from the Latin for everyone. Uh, the first foray into public transportation were horse-drawn uh, carts uh, on wheels, uh, which anyone could ride if they were willing to pay the price of the ticket. Uh, so this was a real innovation in transportation. Uh, the uh, next innovation, as the service began to grow, was that the mode changed from selling individual rides to selling an increasingly integrated service. Uh, once public transportation became a service that you could rely upon, it facilitated the concept of separating the residents from the workplace. Uh, for centuries, for millennia, people had worked very close to where they lived. Uh, the commute was by walking. It was the, you know, the residents upstairs from the shop kind of concept. Uh, the bus really began us down the path of changing that to a city that could rely on workplaces being separated from 
residences, allowing the city to grow more and grow in a more varied way, with higher density in some places and lower density in others. So we begin to shift from a concept of the omnibus as a transportation initiative and a transportation innovation uh, to an innovation in the way cities can function and grow. The, uh, the Haas cart eventually was placed on rails in order to improve productivity. The same number of horses could pull a higher number of seats uh, in, the, in the cart, improving the productivity uh, and the capacity of the system. Uh, but by the same token, uh, building rails into streets is a major innovation into publicly owned infrastructure. So that required, that technical innovation required uh, public permission in order to build those tracks in the street. And once you're into an area where you require public approval, uh, that all also opens the door to regulation because the public authorities viewed, I think, correctly that if they're going to allow private companies uh, access to the public thoroughfares, there had to be some rules to protect the public in terms of the quality of service, the safety of service, and usually the fares that they're allowed to charge. Uh, eventually, the horses became replaced by electrification. The electrification cleaned up the cities quite a bit. It was a major improvement in public health. Uh, substantially improved the power, again improving the productivity, the number of people who could be uh, moved in the vehicle. Uh, very large economies of scale, not only at the vehicle level, but because it's not efficient to produce electricity for uh, lines that were operating street by street, uh, electricity really pushes the networks into being networks rather than individual lines. Uh, and uh, the economy of scale introduces an interaction with land use intensification. Uh, the, the network allows much more accessibility or connectivity uh, than the previous mode of organizing services only by street. In financing of these systems, I like to call beneficiary payment. Uh, we tend to talk a lot about user pays. User pays, in my view, is a somewhat regressive view of how to finance transportation because it puts the entire burden on the rider. As a practical matter, most systems devolve to user payment because if people want access to more opportunity in the urbanizing areas, they either uh, buy their way in uh, or they don't get to participate. In auto-oriented societies, that means it's not just the price of the gasoline. You have to buy the vehicle or you're not a fully equal citizen. Uh, in public transportation systems, the user is the person, is the rider. Uh, but they're only one of the beneficiaries. The other beneficiary in these systems are the land developers and the end users of the land, the, the major employers who require access to employees the companies that require access to customers, they are also beneficiaries of the transportation system, but they're often uh, protected by uh, lack of visibility. Uh, so we've developed, in my view, a bad habit of uh, viewing user payment as the right way of doing things. Uh, my own view is it's a practical way of doing things, but it is quite regressive. And to really have the kind of transportation systems I believe we need, we need to get the other beneficiaries paying their share. Now, in the early days of the electrical systems, uh, further intensified as we began to see subways, public transportation really was the only form of accessibility it's before the automobile. So in that period, land developers very often were parts of the subway and streetcar systems, 
actually did help to finance those investments. So we had a model in the late 1800s, early 1900s in the United States, where more than just the direct riders financed these systems. The other beneficiaries represented by the landowners were participating in that system. Uh, the entry of the automobile changed that in a way that I'll get to in a minute. But I want to call your attention to this photograph. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Tremont Street in Boston before the construction of the subway. And I think it gives you a vivid reminder that the subway was not constructed primarily to improve the, fall, the flow of the streetcars, which could now be underground and less impeded by pedestrians and goods movement. It was as much motivated to get the excessive congestion off of Tremont Street. So again, I think this photograph conveys that the beneficiary of the subway was only partly the rider, but also in substantial part the landowners who ended up with a much more peaceful cityscape after the construction of the subway. Uh, the subway, of course, then in turn allows still further intensification of land use, continuing the uh, support for the growth of the metropolitan area. Um, now, in the immediate period after World War I, automobiles become uh, much more prevalent. Uh, the development of assembly line techniques, particularly by Henry Ford, reducing the cost of the automobile, expanding the number of people who could afford them, changes in public policy, encouraging auto orientation in the land use form through zoning, uh, represent a very dramatic change in the environment within which transportation is operating. The competition for the automobile uh, weakened the viability of these high capital streetcar systems led to a greater need for subsidy uh, or in the lack of subsidy facing loss of service, particularly in the low density markets. Uh, and of course, new zoning led to much more of the city being low density markets. As the land use pattern changes, there's a greater and greater tendency to convert electric streetcars to buses or to serve the new areas with buses because the buses cost less and are more flexible. So in the short run sense, the bus is very attractive. Uh, but this flexibility, which is the strength of the bus, also uh, has a downside to it, which is the stability of the service is much less. When you've got a major capital investment in the form of the track and the electric system, the out-of-pocket cost of actually running service is a smaller proportion of the cost. So there's a tendency to run frequency, frequent service even in the off-peak. The motto in some streetcar systems used to be always the next streetcar in sight. Uh, it was an early version of these apps to tell you when the next bus is coming. You could look down the street and literally see the next streetcar on the way, which led to a lot of confidence that you could take public transportation, that it really was going to be there when you needed it. As you get into a system dominated by the bus, the operating cost is the primary cost. The level of capital investment is much lower. So there's much stronger tendency for the provider to cut back on the frequency of service in the off-peak period and deliver over time less and less convenient service, particularly in the off-peak and especially in the newly formed lower density areas. Uh, the uh, collateral damage on the consumer side is that there's another kind of uh, benefit or economy of scale uh, that I like to call an economy of scale of consumption. Economy of scale of production, we understand. It means, you know, it makes sense to have one electric power plant for a whole network. For the consumer, 
the networks that were the result of electrification provided an economy of scale because now you weren't confined to service along one route and a requirement to pay another fare to get onto another route. You evolved into a system of networks where you paid one ticket and had free transfer privileges throughout that network. So there was a an economy of scale redounding to the benefit of the rider that accompanied the economy of scale of production with the electric power systems, but without the stability inherent in the inflexibility, and I'm using inflexibility as intentionally as a, as a positive term here, that the inflexibility of the electric rail services led to more reliable service for the customer in to a reliability from the point of view of investors that they could invest in transit-oriented development with some confidence that the service would continue to be there because of the large sunk cost in capital investment in the electric systems. As the electric systems start getting dismantled and replaced with buses, there's now much more flexibility for providers to trim back that service and therefore much more reason for an intelligent investor to rely upon public transportation service because there was much less reason to believe that it would continue to be available uh, with suitable frequency uh, in the future. So your inherent willingness to invest uh, on the part of the land use developers goes down as the system becomes less and less dominated by the electric streetcar systems. And, uh, Transit-oriented development in this period of auto ascendancy that begins in the 1920s, transit-oriented development essentially becomes relegated to a kind of niche market in some downtowns, particularly those that were lucky enough to have invested in subways uh, that, that were such a large sum cost that uh, there was some reason to believe that those, those downtowns were going to continue to be good places to invest. Uh, another aspect of the omnibus no longer serving off, fundamentally departing from its original premise, is that the need for subsidy, uh, which was not well understood, because we had been uh, for more than 50 years living in a world where there was not a need for government subsidy. Public transportation was the only act in town. Uh, now that the auto was providing very strong competition. Uh, the public transportation system needed subsidy. The lack of understanding of that need led the providers to continually weaken service and to fail to keep pace with the growth of the urbanized area, particularly because that growth in the urbanized area was at low densities, inherently difficult to serve. This reduction in the proportion of the metropolitan area relying on public transportation in turn weakens the political will uh, to political will to invest and subsidize because the non-user beneficiaries are no longer uh, as significant. So there's a there's a, a weakening of the public transportation network uh, which causes a weakening of the potential political will to take the kind of action of public investment and public subsidy required to make these systems really work. Uh, this next slide is about austerity stressing the political will, and I mean the term stressing uh, in the sense of puts great stress upon, uh, causes great pain for our political will. Perhaps I should call it austerity weakens political will, to be more clear. Uh, the, the maintenance of the public transportation subsidies become more and more difficult because transit riders are becoming a political minority, and those riders tend to be less affluent, so they have less political power, uh, and uh, we're in a downward spiral where that weakened political power, in turn, weakens the quality of the service, still leading to even less effective service. Um, 
The other aspect that's going on throughout this period, and indeed continues today without adequate notice, is an effect called the Bomal effect, identified by an economist named Bomal back in the 1960s. Labor costs in any metropolitan area tend to rise faster than the average rate of inflation because in order to attract labor, you have to pay the prevailing wage in that metropolitan area. The income of the average transit rider grows at less than the rate of inflation. So if your ability to charge fares relates to the income of the riders, you inherently have a growing subsidy requirement or continual cutbacks in service. Uh, the pro providers often don't notice this. We have recurring uh, events where people declare the problem of public transportation solved with certain tax and certain level of subsidy without recognizing that the need for subsidy for the same amount of service will grow over time. If we don't understand that, uh, we don't understand the dynamic of where public, what it takes to keep public transportation growing and vibrant. Uh, most metropolitan areas are substantially underserved by public transportation. If our objective is to feed growing high quality service with, uh, with the level of amenity that people will love and with the level of accessibility that will allow people to flourish in the urbanized areas, uh, public transportation, I believe, is essential. The financial and environmental costs of the automobile are growing and uh, compete directly in less developed cities compete directly with the ability to finance sewer and water systems, which are absolutely essential to public health. So it's a serious problem if we don't adequately serve the public transportation need. That's a problem in somewhat stagnant metro areas in the United States, mature, slow-growing metro areas. It's an even more severe problem in rapidly growing uh, urbanizing metropolitan areas. In both of these dominant circumstances, bus rapid transit offers real promise to provide significantly improved public transportation service to substantial portions of the metropolitan area more quickly than would be either financially or politically feasible if we were trying to do the same thing with primarily rail services. So there's a real strategic advantage to BRT. At the same time, BRT is often oversold. Uh, the, there are many situations, uh, certainly in the cities I'm familiar with, many more situations where traditional bus service or uh, upgraded bus service are practical and desirable where BRT, full BRT, as some people would call it, are simply not feasible and I would argue simply not desirable. So I think there's been a tendency to take a potentially very useful tool and oversell it and try to insist that it is the only answer, the one size fits all. Uh, there are a lot of denigrating terms, BRT light, not true BRT. Uh, of course, some of the rail advocates have the same uh, bad habit. Uh, the answer is like rail, what was the question? Uh, in the cases of both BRT and rail investments, which have important roles to play, it's very important that we don't overplay the number of situations in which these applications are useful. And especially uh, that we remember that the traditional bus flexibility to serve much of the metropolitan area needs to be celebrated and protected as a precondition of success for both and either rail or BRT. There's been a bad habit of viewing traditional bus service as a source of subsidy that we can redirect or divert into rail or BRT systems because they're more fun. The grassroots uh, that feed our systems, that last half mile service is usually provided by traditional buses and I think that's an aspect that we ignore at, to the peril of our public transportation system. If we're adding rail or BRT, 
we need to view them as net incremental services, not substitutes for the buses which connect to that last half mile. Uh, BRT also, in my view, does not convey the inflexibility and the commitment that rail investments convey and are less likely to stimulate the level of confidence that will lead to the high-density transit oriented development. Remember, we're trying to change the form of the cities at the same time as we're trying to service the demand generated by the current form of the city. True success for many BRT investments will be proven when the cities grow so well that the BRT needs to be replaced by rail. The uh, Arguing, as some in the United States do, that we can, quote, save money by investing in flexible BRT service rather than an inflexible, more expensive rail investment, I think that's a weakening of transit commitment, and I think it's movement in the wrong direction. We shouldn't be trying to save money. We should be investing more money to make our cities more transit-oriented. On the other hand, if we frame the argument that we can provide BRT in three or four corridors instead of one corridor per rail, that I think makes sense. It means we can cover more of the metropolitan area, build the political wills to support public transportation by broadening the participation. That's a strategic use of BRT that moves us in the right direction. Doing BRT in one corridor instead of rail is some zero or worsening. Doing BRT in multiple corridors instead of rail in one corridor, I think is a significant benefit. The context is very important here, and we need to be sure that if we're saving money, we're using the savings to invest in transit, not in some new highway interchange on the fringes, which unfortunately is what happens too often. The, uh, also, I think we have to recognize that urban design aspects of BRT are often undesirable and in many cases unacceptable to local communities. High speed is not nice when you're trying to cross the street. Long distance between stops, which is nice for the operator, is not so nice for the customers who have to walk those distances. The long vehicles are nice during the peak hour when they accommodate a lot of seats, they're not so nice in the off peak when they lead to infrequent service. I'd rather have lots of smaller buses that come more frequently than a few large buses that come infrequently. The worst stress point in public transportation is not during the normal peak hour. It's at 9 o'clock at night when you're out, out in the front of waiting for a vehicle that doesn't show up. That's when the smaller bus really has a competitive advantage. Uh, there are, there tend to be very few locations in the metropolitan areas I'm familiar with where BRT actually works. And we have to be careful to use it where it's appropriate and use regular bus or improved bus or streetcars or light rail. We need to tailor our interventions to the actual circumstances and to the political will of the neighborhoods whose support we need if we're going to grow transit. Uh, we need acceptable urban design. We need a metropolitan approach that allows true regional accessibility. BRT, I think, is an important tool, but it can't be the whole answer. Uh, let me just give a snapshot of a few cities I have some familiarity with uh, to make the point about political will and how I think the most fundamental thing to look at is political will and is BRT helping over I'll come to Boston last. In Chicago right now, people are celebrating new BRT expansions at the same time as the Chicago rail system, which was once the best run system in the United States, is falling apart for lack of investment. That's a phony celebration. Uh, and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be part of it. We shouldn't be celebrating. It's criminal to not be maintaining and improving the rail system in Chicago. The densities in Chicago require that rail system. BRT in that context is a distraction from the real problem, and I think part of the problem. In Seattle, they designed effectively a form of BRT before we had the term. It was supposed to be convertible for rail. 
In fact, when they attempted to do so, technically it had been built incorrectly, so that lost a lot of credibility. It also led to a kind of rail extremism, whereas the bus system that was actually providing a very good service was denigrated as not good enough because it wasn't rare. Uh, and had there been more credibility in the argument that the bus would someday be successfully replaced with rail, it might have been possible to stick to bus because it was more cost effective at the phase that Seattle was. Instead, partly because of the rail failure, the rail conversion failure, they moved, I believe, prematurely to rail. Uh, and I think it's a lose-lose outcome. In Los Angeles, they expanded the rail network at the expense of buses with a lot of socioeconomic pushback, appropriate pushback. I think you're all familiar with these cases. In Houston, about 25 years ago, there were uh, referenda uh, to increase taxes to support rail transportation. A new mayor came in, took the money from the referendum, to increase the size of the police force, substituted buses, got away with it politically because there was a lot of racial tension in the city at the time, dramatically damaged the credibility of the political will. People had voted for a system that was supposed to be a regional rail system. They were treated to bait and switch. They're unlikely to support that kind of referendum again. Uh, in Boston, there's a line called the Silver Line. Uh, it has been called the silver lie by two groups of people. One group who insists that nothing but light rail will work. That group ignores the fact that light rail does not fit on that street, it's Washington Street. They denounce it as the silver lie, and the BRT advocates say, well, it's not real BRT. This is silliness. The silver line is the bus line in Boston which more than covers its cost out of the fare box. It is tremendously popular with the riders, who are the people we ought to be looking at. And instead, we've got fanatics, my term, on both sides, saying, well, it's the silver lie. That's really silly. It's one of the better interventions of the past 20 years in the Boston area. And parts of it need to be converted to rail in order to deliver the level of capacity required to support transit-oriented growth in the new area just outside of downtown called the Innovation District, which has the potential for very high density, but only if we can get people there. And BRT has been tremendously helpful on getting it rolling, but we need full grade separation for that densification to continue. So in short, my theory is we've got to keep our eye on the ball. My view is we're trying to build cities that people will love, that will be accessible, that will grow in an efficient way, and that BRT is one strategy that's very useful in some places, but in many places it needs to be eventually replaced by rail, and we shouldn't be upset with that. That's a sign of success, not a sign of failure. The political will will be strongest in the entire area and population can be served. I come back to the word omnibus. This needs to be for everybody if we're going to deliver the kind of political support required to actually get a public transportation that can meet these standards. Um, so, sorry if I went a bit long. I'm happy to respond to your questions at this time, given my failing eyes and put on these assistance. Okay. So do we have questions? Or? I've convinced you all. I can't believe that's true. So. so the question is, um, when I say BLT is a flexible option, in comparison to a metro, what do I mean exactly? Uh, where is the flexibility in this infrastructure? What I'm saying is that when you invest in rail, particularly subway, but even a light rail system, 
the proportion of investment uh, in infrastructure is much higher, uh, that means that there's much less flexibility to remove that investment downstream. Uh, the strength and weakness of the bus is its flexibility. Uh, you can add it very quickly. That's nice. The bad news is you can also remove it very quickly the next time there's a fiscal crisis. BRT implies a stronger commitment than regular bus because there is some infrastructure investment, but nowhere near as much as is associated with light rail. Uh, so it has less credibility in convincing investors that they should put a lot of money into buildings that rely on public transportation access because uh, they're not sure that public transportation is really going to be there in 10 years. So I don't mean to make it an absolute statement, but as a relative matter, the higher capital investment associated certainly with subways, but also with light rail, I think conveys a stronger level of uh, commitment that private investors who make the land use decisions uh, can rely upon. Uh, let's see, is there, where do I think better bus strategies fit into the framework? I think better, better bus strategies fit everywhere. Uh, we have lots of room for improvement in the bus systems that we have, especially in the older systems. Uh, and uh, I'll quote, uh, there's a fellow named Frank Cruzy, who was the president of the Chicago Transit Authority. And he had this fascinating statement that he used to make, that uh, the Chicago Transit Authority had become expert uh, over decades of financial crisis they had developed great expertise in cutting the quality of service so subtly that only their customers noticed. Uh, it was a maddeningly accurate description of what was going on. It was a political strategy to gradually cut service, not so rapidly as to provide a political backlash. In a big network, you have lots of room to trim to levels that are, that, that are levels of service that are quite inconvenient. Uh, most metropolitan areas in the United States have suffered that kind of history, so there's lots and lots of room for improvement in most of our bus networks. They're not frequent enough. Uh, the bus line that I normally use to come to MIT uh, is a nice bus. Uh, it's overcrowded and it doesn't come frequently enough. If it came at double the frequency, it would be a much better service it would not be useful as bus rapid transit. The frequency of stops helps serve the nature of the land uses along the corridor that I live on. So better bus in my corridor would mean the same old bus, just more frequent. Uh, so I think, you know, the, my mother used to have an Italian expression that uh, you have to make the shoe to fit the foot. And I think, bus services are like that. You have to look at the particular situation of the streets that we're serving by bus and see how we can improve those services to attract more people. In most cases, you will not go to BRT. I believe in most cases, with enough resources, you would go to more frequency. Uh, and you might go to strategies like signal priority at intersections. There's a blend of things that could go into better bus. I, I think it's one of the more exciting areas we're dealing with because it has the potential to build political will across the whole area. I love rail investments, but the problem with rail investments is because of their cost, they're concentrated. So they lack the regional constituency uh, that a generalized improvement of our bus network could, could in my view, generate. Um, in grade separated corridors, such as the case of the Boston Silver Line Tunnel, um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there ever a case in which you think it makes sense to build BRT instead of rail in fully grade separated corridors? 
Oh, absolutely. In the, in the case of the Boston Silver Line, there was not enough money to do the fully grade separated uh, service that we knew would eventually be required. The part of the city uh, just outside of the downtown, uh, today being called the Seaport Innovation District, uh, is an area that had been a seaport district. Uh, activity in the seaport had essentially disappeared, so that it degenerated into mostly a bunch of parking lots. We believed that it was going to grow dramatically, but that growth had not yet occurred. So it didn't make sense to invest, or at least we couldn't convince people that it made sense to invest in grade separation through the whole district because we believed that would become necessary. The strategy we adopted was to build a line which is partially grade separated, but then partially at grade. Uh, bus rapid transit was essential, uh, or at least much more convenient than a rail system would have been, because part of the line is underground and grade separated, part of the line is street running, and the flexibility of the rubber tires was very important. Now, in fact, that area is growing very dramatically. It's clear that more grade separation is needed. I believe we're at the point where there is now the political will to extend the grade separated service. It may make sense at some point to convert it to rail, which would allow us to deliver more capacity into the central subway network with better connectivity. But it was impossible to make that case 20 years ago when all we had was a bunch of parking lots and a lot of dreams. Now we've got a lot of construction sites with high rise buildings coming. It's much more tangible and uh, much more convincing uh, to the broad public that much larger investments are now justified. So I think that the BIT in that case uh, was the right strategy. In fact, it was the only strategy that allowed us to begin uh, to redevelop this area of parking lots. It's one of the hottest places in Boston today, and I think the flexibility of of the form of BRT is what got us there. The next question is about the development of these benefits of BRT. What tests or analyses would better inform us about BRT's ability to encourage more development? I think that's really hard to test because every one of these situations is different and investors do not invest just because there's a rail line or a BRT line. They invest because something else is going on in the metropolitan area that leads them to believe that there's a growth in the need for space. If that condition exists, then there's a decision of, okay, where in the metropolitan area is it prudent to invest? And rail or BRT probably can influence that decision of where to invest. The difference between BRT and rail I think is significant because I think the higher investment required in rail is more convincing to developers. I think it's very, uh, it's very difficult to test that hypothesis because we're talking about land use changes that occur on 20 and 40 year scales. And the kind of before and after picture you'd like to do uh, after you make an investment has nowhere near the scale required to judge the effectiveness from a land use perspective. It may be that in the very rapidly growing Chinese cities, there might be opportunities where these timescales are shrunk. In the Boston context, literally, we were doing the planning for the Silver Line in the Seaport Innovation District in the 1980s, the early 1980s. And the development is now occurring in boom fashion I'd say it really has begun in 2012. So uh, I'm losing track. Is that 30 or 40 years? Long, a long time. Uh, in Chinese cities, that time dimension has shrunk. So it might be possible to actually make some investments and see what works, uh, because you wouldn't have to wait all, all, all that long before you saw some some response. Uh, but I think as a general matter, it's very hard to, to, to test these hypotheses on the language side.
The next question is about whether BRT can be a building block for rail. Do we have any examples of where BRT was built and then removed? That was an argument in Bogota where it was impossible to build a metro for political reasons, but it never happened, and the BRT development has since been delayed for a long time because of the promise about it. Yeah, well, the place that I'm a little bit familiar with is Seattle. Uh, I've only visited there intermittently, but in fact, the bus system they introduced in Seattle was the model we had in mind when we were planning the Silver Line in the South Boston Innovation District. It was taking advantage of the flexibility of rubber tire to reach very far into the suburbs, much further into the suburbs than would have been feasible with rail, yet get into the downtown in a subway to get fairly high concentrations of people delivered into the downtown. Uh, they built the downtown subway with the tracks embedded in the subway so that eventually as demand built they would be able to convert the central portion to a light rail, an underground, a great separated uh, subway light rail, uh, and convert the express bus feeder routes uh, to routes that would uh, basically uh, transfer into the rail system eventually. When the time came to go into the conversion, uh, the rail had been installed improperly uh, so that the, uh, the idea of a seamless transition to rail, which had been promised the public when they built it, uh, turned out to not work. They had to close the subway to operations, rip out the rail, uh, totally relay them, uh, and that that really hurt their credibility. Uh, they then, I think, made things worse by insisting on rail uh, from the beginning in some corridors, particularly to the airport, where the density of, of ridership would have been uh, more appropriate to serving with express bus are a similar kind of bus uh, with the capacity to go into the downtown subway, but they had lost credibility because of the earlier failure. So now they've got a rail system. I have not ridden on the rail system, but I'm told that you know there's such a thing as too much capacity if you've got the investment in before the land use, they have to actually take advantage of that. So the flexibility of the bus in working as the land use develops, I think, is a real asset. And those, are, uh, those aren't exactly success stories, but they're, uh, they could have been success stories if the technical aspect had been handled right. In Boston, I believe we're seeing a bus rapid transit approach to the uh, innovation district, which certainly is succeeding in terms of stimulating the investment. Uh, the, analysis of the numbers of destinations that will be realistically there in 10 years strongly suggest the need to convert that system to rail. Uh, the tunnels were built with the proper space to facilitate conversion to rail. So I believe we will see that succeed as a strategy where the form of bus rapid transit has served well for my guess is it'll be at least 20 years uh, when it gets to the point where it simply can't handle the density of demand that it has generated and needs to be replaced with something with more capacity, which I, I believe will be the case uh, within, I think, 10 years. The next question is about messaging different levels of BRT. If you're studying both street BRT and fixed guideway BRT in separate corridors, how do you differentiate the messaging about those modes without referring to in-street running BRT as BRT light? Uh, I would I would talk about appropriate levels rather than light or heavy. Uh, it, you know, the the shoe has to be designed to fit the foot, and uh, in the interaction with the public, uh, I don't think the public cares nearly so much about the label as they care about how 
the service actually fits their needs. In Boston, there's another section of the Silver Line which runs along Washington Street in an area called the South End. The, uh, there was a group insisting on light rail. Uh, light rail did not really physically fit on that street. Uh, most of the public along the street agreed to the proposition that a form of BRT made more sense. Uh, during the planning process, the, uh, the transit planners were trying to minimize the number of stops in order to achieve greater running speed. The local community demanded that stops be added uh, because they wanted the frequency of of stops consistent with the urban design nature of that neighborhood. Uh, that nature was compounded, it was partly a physical matter, it was also partly a social matter. Uh, at the time that the, the, the BRT or the quasi-BRT investment was taking place on Washington Street, there was still fairly high crime rates in some neighborhoods, so people were very reluctant to walk even two blocks from their home because they'd be crossing some imaginary or some very real turf line and it simply wasn't safe. So they demanded more frequent stops. The MBTA responded by providing the more frequent stops. I argue that the service is a wild success. Again, it's the one line in the, in the whole MBTA system which generates more revenues uh, than, its, than its operating costs. Uh, it's full. I think it's a success. I don't think anybody in those neighborhoods care whether it's called BRT or BRT Light or not real BRT. It's a good bus service. So, this question, if gold standard BRT is implemented in a given corridor consistent with ITDP's BRT standards document, it requires substantial permanent capital investment in stations, lanes, fare collection, etc. What is the evidence that such visible capital investments wouldn't be enough to reassure investors along the rapid transit line that it's there to stay? And if the developments do occur, would that effectively ensure that the demand itself will assure continuation of the service? Well, let me, let me go back historically a bit in, in the Boston area. Uh, unfortunately, the MBTA had, and its predecessor agency, had no problem dismantling very expensive rail systems uh, when they decided that they just wanted to close the gap on this year's budget. They converted systems of pretty high ridership uh, to bus service, leaving the track and the overhead wire in place, in some cases for decades. Uh, those investments that were very visible did generate a public demand to restore the streetcar service the MBTA finally tore up the tracks and pulled down the wires in order to take away the argument of the advocates to restore the streetcar service. So uh, the level, of, I think historically, at least in Boston, the level of investment that has really forced the agency to continue to provide service is the level of investment associated with subways. And to some degree, uh, fully protected median running uh, with track embedded. Uh, if you had a BRT card, or for the sake of argument, in one of those light rail median operations, it would be easier to remove the BRT. In fact, you would end up with some right-wing advocates at the Reason Foundation saying, why don't we make them hot lanes? Why can't I buy my way in? Look at the new technology with a transponder. I can drive my automobile there. Why should the BRT get it? You know, flexibility, which sounds good, turns into a problem when there are large numbers of people who don't agree on a vision of trying to make our cities more transit-oriented and, and, and more accessible. I don't, I don't think there's any proof or disproof here. It's a question of judgment and looking back at the history of the area. My look at the history of the Boston area is that it takes a lot of investment to get the private sector to feel uh, comfortable committing their dollars to high-density development.
All right, we have two questions left in the queue. We probably have time for a third if someone wants to get a last question in under the wire. We'll go ahead and take the second to last one here now. If the Silver Line waterfront corridor in Boston is converted to rail, how would the branch service to the airport and new service to East Boston and Chelsea be accommodated? Isn't the solution actually to just ensure that the Silver Line is fully grade separated in South Boston and utilize the substantial unused capacity to run more frequent buses? Uh, two things. Number one, yes, of course, in the short term, the right answer is to fully grade separate so that we can continue the very convenient service that runs one branch to the airport, which goes through an automobile tunnel, so effectively cannot convert to rail. Uh, and I think that is definitely the next step to take and makes a lot of sense. It is also totally predictable that that solution will run out of capacity as the density of develop development in the innovation district continues to grow. What's happened with this line, and I apologize, I should have had a graphic for this, uh, a portion of the Silver Line uh, runs from a subway station at South Station underground through two underground stations, fully grade separated. Then it rises to an at-grade crossing and one branch goes to the airport through an automobile tunnel, and another branch runs street running uh, along a continuation of the innovation district. Most of the demand in the early years has come from the link to the airport. As the development comes online in the innovation district, as those parking lots are replaced by high-rise office buildings, more and more the demand uh, that needs to be satisfied is the demand within the innovation district. Based on uh, land use densities already approved by the city and into construction, there is going to be difficulty serving that much demand with the silver line, even assuming the grade separation, which I agree is the right next step to take. Uh, if the area is going to continue to grow, I believe it's going to require the rail connection, which will do two things. One, it will have more capacity in the innovation district. Two, it has the potential to connect deeper into the downtown network, connecting not only to the red line at South Station, but also to the orange line and the green line, and making it more of a network service. That does raise the issue of, OK, now what are you going to do with those people currently using the silver line to get to the airport? Uh, there are two strategies for substitute services to the airport directly from South Station, which I believe can succeed. Uh, they could not succeed today because the infrastructure is not in place at South Station. By the time that the facts warrant the conversion to rail, which I think is about 10 years off, I believe the rest of the system will have filled in to the degree that we can get high-quality, continued rubber tire service to the airport in the form of the current Silver Line service, but not in the same subway, which will, I think, become oversubscribed. There's also a technological middle ground, which is you could imagine in, uh, having track light rail service and BRT service in the su same subway so that the bus could continue to operate to the airport, continuing to use the current infrastructure. But uh, I've been told those services have worked in Germany. Somehow in Boston, we have not managed to reach German levels of uh, discipline in running complicated systems. So I wouldn't want to bet the farm on that. But I think we've got 10 years to figure that out. And that could be an option. All right, the last question we have is, in terms of BRT implementation, could we generally say that we've not done an unbiased benefit-cost analysis for many of the cities in the world? Uh, of course we could say that. I don't believe there's any such thing as an unbiased benefit-cost analysis anywhere, so I have to agree with that statement. Uh, the, the, to me, the whole issue is BRT shouldn't be a religion. BIT is a useful strategy. 
Uh, the, the case that I saw presented by Penalosa in one of his talks at MIT that was just revolutionary in, 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 the, in the graphic impact was a graphic of Bogota that showed what could have been done in one rail corridor versus the network that was possible uh, with DLT. And the real issue that, that made all kinds of sense to me was that you could serve, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the market with BRT, and you could serve 10 percent of the market with rail. So BRT was the right step to take. It may be that at some point in history some of those lines should become rail systems, but in the meanwhile, Peñalosa succeeded in getting good public transportation to a lot more of the city than would have been feasible on a comparable time frame with uh, with rail, and, and, and time matters when you're trying to build a political constituency. So to me, that's the powerful argument. And, and the uh, it, it, and, and the the technique that you use has to depend, in my view, on where the city is. Is the city growing rapidly or not? Does it actually have opportunities to serve eight or ten corridors? I've not been to Bogota. I have been to Buenos Aires. Uh, some of the avenues in Buenos Aires, I love the city, but some of those avenues are horrible. They're at-grade highways, dozens of lanes wide, very hard for a pedestrian to navigate. I don't think that's the, that's not what I'd want to see in Boston, and we don't have rights of way that large, so it's not even a feasible option to talk about. In cities that have a lot of avenues, those are viable options. I don't believe, personally, it's a good long-range outcome. I'd rather see some of those services put into subways, and I'd rather see you know, much more of those wide avenues being linear parks and contributing to the urban design amenity of the city. But as a short-term matter, if you've got that kind of right-of-way, BRT or even light rail at grade makes more sense than a subway if you don't have the money to do the subway. So it, it's a matter of what what options do you have at the moment in your particular city in these particular corridors. And even within the same city, it may make sense to do BRT in one corridor and rail in another corridor and just have a bus in another corridor. I just think we need this conversation to be much more practical. Uh, also, as we've gotten much more in the good habit of interacting with the public, the level of flexibility that gives you is extremely important because when people in one neighborhood say, well, that's a nice theory, but you don't understand. I can't walk two blocks from my house. I need more stops. You're able to respond. Uh, so I, I, I think that flexibility is very, very important. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I appreciate the chance to interact with you. So,